When you find yourself suddenly isolated in the wilderness, nature isn't concerned with your comfort, but the laws of physics still apply, and understanding basic civil engineering principles is your best tool for survival. The first concept you need to master is structural stability, and it all comes down to one shape, the triangle. It is the only geometric shape that is inherently rigid. Picture a simple square frame made of four branches. If you push on one of the top corners, the whole thing easily deforms, leaning over into a parallelogram. This collapse is called racking, and it's why four-sided structures fail under lateral loads, like wind. The corners simply pivot. Now, imagine taking another branch and placing it diagonally across that same wobbly square, connecting two opposite corners. You've just created two triangles. Push on that corner now and nothing happens. The frame is rigid. That diagonal brace has locked its geometry. This works because it introduces the two fundamental forces of engineering. Tension, the act of pulling something apart, and compression, the act of pushing something together. When you push on the frame, that diagonal brace is put under compression, preventing the square from collapsing in on itself, while other parts of the frame are pulled into tension, holding it together. This collection of triangles is the basis for one of engineering's most powerful tools, the truss. A truss is simply an assembly of triangles arranged to distribute heavy loads with incredible efficiency. Its genius is how it handles forces. Think about a heavy load of snow pushing straight down on a flat roof beam. That's a transverse force, and it tries to bend and snap the beam in the middle. A truss takes that downward transverse force and converts it into axial forces. That is pure tension and compression. That runs straight along the length of its wooden members. Imagine a simple triangular bridge truss. As gravity pushes down on the top, that force is channeled down the angled sides. Those angled beams are put into compression, pushing outward, while the bottom beam connecting them is pulled taut, holding everything in tension. This lets you bridge a gap or create overhead cover using much lighter, smaller pieces of wood instead of one massive heavy log that you could never lift. Now, let's apply this directly to a survival shelter. The classic A-frame is the most direct application of these principles. An A-frame is, in its simplest form, a single truss repeated over and over. Its two main angled legs form a triangle that efficiently transfers any load from the apex, the peak, straight down the legs and into the ground. The steepness of its angle is not an accident. It's a critical engineering decision. Picture a side view of an A-frame during a downpour. The steep walls act like a watershed, shedding environmental loads like rain and snow immediately. This prevents the catastrophic weight accumulation that could flatten a shelter with a shallower roof pitch. The forces are constantly being driven into the ground, making the structure incredibly stable against gravity and the elements. It's a design perfected by physics to remain standing. But what about the most common improvised shelter, the lean-to? From an engineering perspective, a basic lean-to is a disaster waiting to happen. It's essentially just half a square propped up against a tree or rock. It has no triangulation. Its ability to stand relies entirely on the friction of its main support beam, the ridge pole, against its base. A strong gust of wind hitting it from the side can easily cause it to rack and collapse. To properly engineer it, you must introduce a triangle. Picture that flimsy lean too. Now, take a sturdy branch and brace it diagonally running from the middle of the ridge pole down to a point on the ground away from the shelter's entrance. This single diagonal brace creates the necessary triangle, locking the structure in place and giving it the rigidity it needs to resist the wind. You have transformed a simple lean-on into a stable, triangulated structure. Once you grasp how triangles govern structural reality, you must learn how to apply those abstract principles to the messy, imperfect materials you actually find on the forest floor. This application starts by treating every lashing as a structural node, ensuring your irregular branches are locked tight enough to prevent rotation and maintain the geometry of the frame. When you're working with the chaotic shapes of nature, the connections are everything. Think of these lashings, whether from cordage or stripped roots, as the wilderness equivalent of an engineer's gusset plates or high tensile bolts. Their job isn't just to hold two sticks together, it's to create a rigid joint that forbids rotation. By locking that angle in place, you force the loads to travel cleanly along the length of each branch, keeping them in either pure compression or pure tension. This is the secret to a strong frame. The material choice itself is a calculation. Do you need elasticity to bend a piece into an arc? Use flexible live wood. Do you need uncompromising rigidity for a vertical support? Cured. Solid dead wood is your answer. 
Imagine cinching that final wrap on a lashing, the fibers groaning as you pull it tight, locking two intersecting logs into a single immovable unit. From that single joint, we scale up to a complete system, like the classic debris hut. It's far more than a simple pile of leaves. Structurally, it's an elegant solution. At its heart is a long ridge pole, a primary beam supported on one end by a robust A-frame truss. This A-frame is the main load-bearing element. From that ridge pole, secondary branches or ribs are angled down to the ground, creating a long vaulted shape, a pseudo-arch that provides the interior space. The genius of the design comes from the load application. The massive pile of leaves, pine needles, and forest duff that provides insulation isn't a dangerous weight. It's a perfectly distributed load. It presses down evenly across all the ribs, sharing the burden across the entire frame instead of concentrating it on one weak spot. The slope of those ribs is equally critical, engineered not just for space but to shed the immense weight of rainwater or melting snow, preventing the load from becoming catastrophic. This leads to more advanced engineering considerations in the field, redundancy and failure modes. Redundancy is the principle that the failure of a single component shouldn't cause the collapse of the entire system. You have to build in a margin of safety by anticipating how the structure might fail. Imagine a very long ridge pole, perhaps spanning 12 feet. Under the weight of heavy, wet snow, its most likely failure point is right in the middle, where it will begin to sag and eventually snap. An engineer anticipates this failure mode and adds a safety factor. In this case, it's as simple as placing an extra Y-stick support column directly under the center of the span. This one simple addition can double the load-bearing capacity of the ridge pole, preventing a catastrophic failure when you need the shelter most. It's about identifying the weakest link and reinforcing it before it's ever tested. Finally, we have to consider the shelter's connection to the earth and the environmental loads it will face. In civil engineering, a building is only as good as its foundation. For a survival shelter, this means anchoring it against more than just the downward pull of gravity. Wind is a powerful force that creates uplift, trying to peel the shelter right off the ground. You have to pin the frame's base logs down, perhaps with stakes or by weighting them with heavy rocks. But you also have to think aerodynamically. Wind is a dynamic, lateral load, meaning it pushes from the side. By orienting your shelter so its narrowest, lowest end faces the prevailing wind, you minimize its profile and reduce the drag. This prevents the wind from catching a broadside and tearing the structure apart. It's the difference between a structure that withstands the storm and one that becomes part of it. Which of these structural principles do you think is most often ignored by people building shelters in the wild? And have you ever seen a design fail because it lacked proper triangulation? 